Let's begin this genial little picture with a couple of unastounding facts. It is hardly news that the population of the world is rapidly increasing, as is evident from the scenes now moving before you. Montevideo, Dublin, Copenhagen, Buenos Aires. It's fashionable these days to be alarmed about the exploding population. For instance, geneticists are, they logically worry about feeding the oncoming population. And fishermen are, theirs is more of a brooding involvement since they number about 40 million men, women, and kids in the United States alone. If these new hatches grow overnight to fishermen's size, where can we stand the millions who are bound to pursue the fish? Close fellowship is one thing, but perpetual togetherness corrodes the very spirit of Isaac Walton's philosophy. So we come to the second prosaic truth. The fisherman tends to dream, even standing shoulder to shoulder with his fellow sportsmen in true but irritated fraternity. He pictures himself in complete solitude. Perhaps under the great shoulders of the Andes. Or working the waters not far from where an inlet spills into a New Zealand lake or fishing an arm of glacial waters that reflect the Kilbuck Mountains. Moreover, fishermen have looked at Mercator projections and they are aware that the red rash of dots denoting population densities are confined to limited areas of the continent. Great reaches of the world have few men, much water. And sometimes fish in such numbers that they can be taken by hand and creeled properly in the hip pocket. Of course, fishermen have always known this, but the modern fisherman has another little piece of knowledge made common in the last five years. He knows that once the fishermen of ordinary means could only hunger for the distant fishing grounds. To reach them took at least a week, possibly several. If he had the money, he may not have had the time. And if he had the time, he may not have had the money. Now one of those two barriers has vanished. The Earth's dimensions have not altered, but distance, as measured by time and movement, has been radically compressed. Today, the commercial jet aircraft links up every corner of the free world. If the fisherman or woman is of a mind, and if he has saved a dollar here and a dollar there, he can be off today and fish any waters of the free world by tomorrow. in Ireland. And quickly to the country near the Bowna Hitch. of Irish foliage are of an almost infinite range. Vocabulary. Would a soft but fervent Irish prayer help the hard-working angler in Sweden? 
Seven months have passed. You've seen summer and fall come and go and watched the ice, snow, and winds strike the temperate area of the northern hemisphere. But such is the structure of the world and its relation to the sun, combined with the modern jet, that here you are in Sydney in summer. Wear shoes or boots with metal cleats. The weed-covered rocks are like glass. The carnage among rock hoppers has alarmed some sections of Australian society, just as refined elements in Arkansas a hundred years ago grew restless when the local boys persisted in holding a handkerchief between their teeth and whittling away at each other with bowie knives. Not much need be said about the superlative deep sea fishing off Australia. Hardly a man is alive who doesn't remember how Zane Gray, to escape his mythical lean hip riders of the Purple Sage, hurried off to Australia. Here he captured black marlin, striped marlin, mako sharks, and tuna. Not all the spreads in Texas could have given them room to roam. This is the Dorado, whose sharp teeth and powerful jaws were not put there to whistle Dixie. The Dorado is an extremely fast fish, attaining a size of over 40 pounds and forever in a sour humor about life generally, slashing at everything that comes his way. Unless some of our sportsmen have been secretly betting beers, there has been nothing competitive about the fishing we've seen up to this point. Its quality has been the pleasure each individual has gotten from the sport. Now we participate briefly in some competitive fishing. aware that this is Honolulu, the beach Waikiki. And the short time in Honolulu was only a pause en route to Kona for the International Billfish Tournament. Fishing, we suppose, is the last major sport to succumb to the official full-time statistician who now dominates baseball, football, and Swiss Alpine horn blowing. Graven on the minds of these competitors are the statistics of last year's race. 33 marlin and 20 tuna boated, 193 authentic strikes, and 130 hookups. just as we surmised, 189 pounds. This it develops as a winner in the light tackle division. Not quite 300 years ago, both the English and the French, obsessed with their search for the mysterious Northwest Passage that would continue for another 100 years or more, first heard of this country from the Crees. It is the Hayes River watershed, which, like the Nelson, runs into Hudson Bay near York Factory. The waters here are not the haze itself, but its fabled tributary, God's River, the cataract of true magnitude from its first sweeping rush out of God's Lake until it plunges into the haze and pours on into the bay. Many of the Crees still make their home here. Back in 1658, they told the French explorer Radisson of the furs and fish of this vast, cold tundra country. Today, God's River still is celebrated for the size of its brook trout. Five and six pound brookies are commonplace. Seven and eight pound fish are not uncommon. The Crees run this occasionally wild river with its huge and often jagged boulders, its smoking rapids, with a kind of extrasensory aplomb. Sometimes in reading the water, they swing abruptly to shore and quietly pointing, they show the angler where the big trout rests. 
its nose into the current, impervious to the chatter of the outboard or the shadow of the canoe. Only enough trout for the cookout are necessary. The fish being released run from three pounds, the smallest, to one that goes six pounds, nine ounces. They get their size from feeding on the hordes of fry from the whitefish, which spawn in God's river before ascending to God's lake, and from the tremendous insect life that proliferates in the barrens. Purists have demeaned the lake trout as an indifferent fighter, but in God's Lake, as in many northern Canadian and Alaskan waters, he is a powerful fish, big, aggressive, and an especially tough, frenzied fighter once he's brought close to the net. For 15 or so days after the ice goes out in mid-June in God's Lake, the Lakers range the surface, feeding tirelessly. Each year, a dozen or so of better than 45 pounds are netted. The far more numerous fish of 6 to 30 pounds fight a relentless war of their own. They are indeed almost as stubborn as a Swedish fish. A lady of our acquaintance steadily fishes the Pacific off Mexico's Acapulco, conducting a competition entirely her own. She seeks to reduce her line's test weight year by year. Her husband skippers the boat. His skill as pilot is essential to her goal. Two years ago in the Bristol Bay country of Alaska, a fisherman in 14 hours ranged widely and caught these seven species, rainbow, landlocked silver salmon, dolly varden, grayling, golden trout, northern pike, and lake trout. It is now last summer. This fisherman, Red Smith, the syndicated columnist for the New York Herald Tribune, at the moment is on to one of still another species, the king salmon, running fresh from the sea up the Naknak River. Red earlier had four days in the tundra. Let him tell about it in retrospect while he plays this king salmon. Go swooshing off by jet to fish the streams and lakes of the Alaskan Peninsula got no argument from me. I am always intrigued by the hope of fishing a country that may be treeless as some tundra waters are. If there is foliage around, I fish more in the trees than upon the water. I make other little mistakes. I have just asked the pilot what that big, dark-winged bird may be in a pothole below. Not a bird, he tells me, a moose. Those are his antlers. And just then, a great head lifts from the wings, looking up incuriously, and it certainly was a moose. As an amateur naturalist out for the sport alone, I saw no reason to join these fishermen. I can always find my own crowd in the beaver kill, and these chaps below may be the jovial kind who slap strangers on the back. We banked right. She was a good-looking kid when I caught her. Of course, some of the good-lookingness has worn off since. A nice grayling caught in a heavy rain. We have now seen rainbow frequent this stream, whose only fault is its foliage. Naturally, I am across the river and into the trees. It seems only sporting to come over and help a companion with the landing of a rainbow who has taken his number 10 deerfly bucktail. I perform the task rakishly, a boyish smile covering my wounded knees. <laughs> 